Good afternoon. Um, I think it's time then to get started. Um, welcome to our session on communication ethics. I'm Jenny McMillan and I'm Director of Marketing, Content and Communications at Tony and I'm joined today by Hi there, I'm Rachel Safer, a senior publisher for journals at Oxford University Press and also an elected member of the Pope Council. And I'm Bethel, I'm a research support librarian at the University of Cambridge and I sit on the editorial board of the New Review of Academic Librarianship, which is a table of Francis So this session today involves an update on a recent survey which was conducted by the Committee of Publication Ethics with support from Martinage on publication ethics with a very specific focus on arts, humanities and social sciences. Um, we're going to give you a review of that survey and then we're going to look in more detail at the role of COPE and how they use, the, how they hope to use the survey to inform support to their group those working in AHSS. And finally, then we're going to have a look at what this means for librarians in practical terms and what they can do in their role as an advocate for scholarly communications best practice and also what to consider whenever they're coming to publish. So, why this research and why not? Just to give you a little bit of background, COPE was conceived by an editor of a specialist medical journal at VMJ Publishing Group. So it came, it was born from STM. It's since grown to become a fully multidisciplinary organisation. There were perceptions within COPE that some members whose focus wasn't on social science, technology and medicine disciplines might not consider COPE to be as relevant. This perception was reflected in a member survey in 2015, after which COPE committed to engage more with arts, humanities and social science disciplines. As a consequence, in early 2019, COPE, the support of Rutledge, which is part of Taylor and Plexus Group, conducted research to better understand the publication ethics landscape for editors working on journals within these fields. As the world's largest publisher of arts, humanities and social science journals, Rutledge understands the publication ethics challenges faced by journal editors in this field and works alongside editors and editorial boards, providing support on individual cases in line with existing code guidelines. Through this experience, and also being at the sharp end of some emerging types of misconduct, we know that some of the challenges faced by those in arts, humanities and social sciences do differ to those in STEM fields. And just to underline that point, that to reinforce the rationale for this study. This slide shows the proportion of member journals are subject uh, represented by Pope, and just under a third are arts, humanities, and social sciences. So the worry was that this community isn't being well served by current resources. So the research itself. The research set out to assess four areas with this audience. The first was awareness. They wanted to establish whether those working in this field are familiar with Pope and understand the role and scope of the work it draws. They then went on to examine challenges, to look in detail at the issues that these editors are commonly dealing with and what support they need, and then to assess the needs and gaps, to assess what support COPE could give. And finally, the research looked at communication preferences, to look at how editors working in these areas would like to hear from COPE. The research followed a two-stage methodology, with online focus groups initially to refine the themes of the research, and pinpoint questions, and then an online survey which was only open to arts, humanities, and social science editors. <clears throat> the survey had 646 respondents, and I just want to draw your attention to the bias towards US, UK, Europe, and also Australia and New Zealand, so quite an angle from um, bias from the editors who were responded. And this will be important to bear in mind later whenever we come to look at some of the um, themes and issues that the survey brought up. This slide, which I'm sorry is quite hard to read, but gives you context of the subject specialisms. So just to pull out um, those who responded, the majority of them were working in education, multidisciplinary history, social sociology, psychology, and behavioral sciences. And this slide just makes that information a little bit easier to digest in terms of the subject areas and the respondents. So I just want to focus a little bit on some of the limitations of the research and um, go through these to flag them. I don't think they make the results any less interesting or valid, but it's important to bear them in mind. So, picking on a distribution sample, there isn't reliable data available on the geographic distribution of academic editors anywhere, but we feel the sample is unlikely to affect the sector overall. 
product image was overrepresented in the results because although we promoted the survey more broadly than our own poll of editors, we were better able to target our own contacts. This isn't necessarily inappropriate because of the prominence of Bartlidge in these fields, but some of the other major publishers were underrepresented. Sample size. So there's only ever been one other survey similar to this, which was conducted in 2009. And this was the sample size was nearly triple the um, this survey from 2009, but it was still not large enough for subject level differences to be fully apparent. Geographical representation was very really strong, but there wasn't really enough response beyond the US and the UK. Subject comparison group. So one thing that we will pick up on later is that it would be useful to conduct a similar study with STM editors. And then respondent self-selection. So we feel that we're likely to have attractive respondents with a pre-existing interest in publishing ethics. And we also feel that some of the editors who responded may have self-censored, even though the survey was confidential. So those are sort of a few of the trip hazards in the survey data. Okay, the results, the big reveal. Um, survey respondents were asked to respond to reports on how serious, widespread, most frequent the issues they experienced were, as well as indicating what they felt least confident in dealing with. In the results that I'm going to pick apart now, we're going to focus on those that were most widespread and most frequently experienced. And over the next few slides, we're going to look in some detail at language issues, detecting plagiarism and fraudulent submissions. But I also wanted to pull out other areas that were both widespread or frequent. So, 55% of respondents highlighted that dealing with bias in reviewer comments was one of their top five issues, with 19% saying this happened frequently. These included a lack of support on ethics related to editors, actions, reviewers, or guest editors. So Claire will know this, but quite often journals will almost um, contract out the editing of one or two special issues during the course of the year. And these guest editors are somewhat less experienced than the regular editor for the journal. Um, another area issue in this area was achieving blind review when reviewers and authors have ties or when their working versions of papers are often published online through journal submission, which is happening more frequently as people use preprints to test the order with their work beforehand. Another issue that people responded was that 54% of respondents experienced issues with the way the authors received and responded to criticism with 27% of them flagging this as a big <coughs> issue. Editors responded feeling responsible for mentoring authors, such as encouraging them to keep revising manuscripts and to focus on constructive comments. They also saw themselves as mediating the relationship between author and publisher, if they would have been particularly critical. There were no prominent regional differences, <coughs> although some regions had very small sample sizes, and editors from across all subject areas experienced very similar ethical challenges. <coughs> so looking at some of these issues in more detail, language issues first. So language issues were reported as both widespread and frequent. Addressing language and writing quality whilst remaining inclusive was the most prevalent issue with 64% encountering it and 42% of those encountering it frequently. This reflects wider issues of diversity and inclusion in scholarly publishing and in the research landscape overall. <coughs> Balancing issues of language and diversity was a key discussion point in the online focus groups that we conducted, with some editors indicated tensions between a full representation of authors globally and the quality of papers due to issues around language skills and access to the literature. We don't really want to stop good ideas being published just because of people's language isn't really appropriate. <coughs> so this is becoming an increasing challenge in a global research environment, which has seen a rapid growth in journal submissions, especially from areas like India and China, and where the volume of research is only increasing. It's an area where we as publishers are working hard to support our editors whilst helping them to maintain quality standards. There are services available to help with language polishing, but this is an area where editors clearly feel they would be able to support and guidance from an organisation like Hope. Another challenge that came through the survey was detecting plagiarism. So issues with detecting plagiarism and poor attribution standards were encountered by 58% of respondents. This was particularly prevalent amongst business, finance and economic editors 
79% of editors working in these fields reported issues with plagiarism. Half of the respondents had experienced self plagiarism, with 22% saying this arose frequently. Again, this was especially widespread in business, finance, and economics, with 65% of editors working in these fields reporting that as an issue. Avoiding and responding to self plagiarism was an issue for this group, which typically manifests itself for IHSS as unattributed reuse of an author's own work without realising that this is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because for something to enter the scholarly record, it's meant to be a unique contribution, and self plagiarism undermines this because it could also leave authors in breach of their copyright agreements. So, another area that um, people find serious was fraudulent submissions. So, 44% of those respondents consider these to be one of the most serious ethical issues, although in fact, only around 25% of respondents had experience of this issue. Um, this was never previously mentioned in research with STM editors, um, but we have experience of this ourselves. We're working really hard to match code guidelines in this area, but it's a challenging area, with, especially within AHSS, because opinion is a fundamental part of the literature, and sometimes it's hard with the hoax paper where someone has deliberately set out to defraud a journal or an editor to tell whether what they've produced is um, research or is something else. It leaves us with challenges and our editors with challenges with what to do whenever we suspect there's a fraudulent submission but we then get no response from an author, which is, means it's a grey area for us as publishers and for editors and at present there's no guidance in these areas to help. So I've mentioned before a few times what the previous study that was conducted. This gives a comparison between the wager study from 2009 and the current research. The wager study sample size, as I said, was much smaller, so again there are limitations with the data, as well as the age of the information, so I think this is something worth exploring more. The two studies have some overlap, but what is most striking is the differences in the lists, as you can see. Can you read this okay? Yeah. Okay. So self-plagiarism and redundant publication are areas that both involve, I guess, inappropriate reuse of a piece of work. But this manifests itself differently for FTM and AHSS researchers. In STEM, you see salami slicing sometimes, where authors publish their research in as many almost units as possible for credit. Whereas in AHSSS, it's much more common for authors to reuse portions of their text without proper attribution. Areas of difference also include gift authorship, which is where authorship is attributed to someone who's not actually involved in the original study. Again, this is much more common in STEM fields where you often see a long list of authors and it's very hard to discern an individual's input. This is not a common practice in IHSS. We then had a look at what's driving publication ethics issues and see these are some of the comments that we picked out from what editors fell back to us. So as I said earlier, blind peer review is becoming more difficult. It's more difficult to achieve anonymity for both sides of the peer review process. Globalisation, inclusion and diversity is also an issue, especially because of the growing number of non-English speaking contributions. And this extends for the editors ensuring that the journal has a really wide review of So it's tricky sometimes to recruit enough reviewers from overseas to match the um, <coughs> articles that we're seeing from different countries. Technology and authorship is also become, going to become a challenge and an increasing challenge because what we've seen so far are some machine authored manuscripts which have actually manifested themselves as hoax papers. But we've also seen a book published in the last year by Springer Nature, which was a real, genuine author authored, or machine authored book. So we're going to need to start as publishers to unpick what happens when machines are actually writing the books. What does this mean for copyright? What does this mean for ethics? What does this mean for publishing and research overall? Um, and then one of the other areas that's really driving publication ethics are the academic culture and incentives. So I'm based in the UK and the researchers there have to work through the research excellence framework which sets out a lot of criteria by how their work is judged and assessed. And quite often this means a massive pressure to publish and publish frequently and in certain types of journals. So this encourages some of the slightly slicing and self plagiarism that we see as well. 
So what this research has done is it's thrown up some areas of opportunity for us as publishers to work alongside COPE. To look at developing resources that help us deal with fraud, fabrication and intellectual property and how to deal with plagiarism in Hoke's papers. It also gives us the opportunity to look at language concerns, especially with an objective of ensuring a diverse and inclusive publishing ecosystem. We have the opportunity to look at authorship standards, including looking at conflicts of interest, in conflicts of interest and in relation to qualitative work. And also, there's some areas of advice that we can explore. So I think it's really important to stress that COPE is not an adjudicating body, um, and it's not there to give one-to-one -one advice, but they have forums which allow editors to work through some issues together and to collaborate. So looking at a COPE forum, maybe especially dedicated to AHSS authors, could be a solution here. What next? So this survey gives us a foundation for further collaboration and research between COPE and the Arts, Humanities and Social Science Journal editors. There's opportunity to develop on existing or create new guidance, and there's opportunity to raise awareness of existing resources amongst Arts, Humanities and Social Science Journal editors. And I'm going to hand over to Andrew Rachel to talk about that from a quick point of view. Choose what page it is. Sure. <coughs> Great, so I thought it would help to talk for just a minute about what COPE actually is. Um, as Jenny mentioned, um, COPE was founded 22 years ago by a couple of editors involved with the British Medical Journal, BMJ, um, and it has since expanded um, exponentially. We now have uh, over 12,500 members, about a third of which are AHSS -A uh, titles in over 100 countries. Um, so COPE's real mission is to promote the integrity of research and its publications. And it's managed by uh, a very small staff, um, as well as a number of volunteers. Um, and we're very active. Um, and we sit on the council and the trustee board um, and try to um, come together and, and bring some consensus to some of these contentious issues. Um, and also have some really lively debates, especially around topics like preprint servers right now. There are a lot of um, international um, and globally based um, council members and different disciplines are represented in different positions, some publishers, some journal editors, others with interest in the area, and our experiences um, give us a lot to disagree about. And so we try to make those disagreements um, transparent to all of you so you can think about the kinds of questions you, perhaps as a journal editor, should be asking around some of these um, maybe newer or more emerging topics. Um, as far as our members, um, it really is a, a very wide range from large publishers to individual journals. And it's important to note that it's actually the journals, not the editors, who are the members of COPE. Um, and there's this wide range, again, of journals and publishers Although notably, at least right now, um, that does not include books um, or specifically um, book non-journal um, publishers as well. So something else we're talking about. We also have associate members who are non-publishers, non-journals, non-journal editors um, who have an interest and a stake in this topic, um, and that might include librarians. Uh, we're also currently exploring expanding our membership um, following a pilot program uh, with six universities globally, and that is really to bring in um, offices of research integrity, research integrity officers, to become more involved because they are a part of the process already. So if we have them as members, we're developing guidelines for them specifically, they can perhaps help us to educate um, folks at their individual institutions and again, sort of broaden the, the remit here as well. So how do we do this? Um, it's really with COPE's core practices. Um, and we develop policies and practices. And a couple of years ago, we sort of organized those around these 10 core principles that you can see on the screen. Um, behind each of these core principles are a number of resources that are freely available, uh, whether you are a member currently or not. 
You can access flowcharts for handling cases of alleged misconduct, infographics, uh, best practice guidelines, um, perhaps most notably around retractions. Those are very popular. Discussion documents, I mentioned preprints earlier. <coughs> A lot of lively discussion happening around that at the moment. Uh, we have monthly newsletters, um, different archives, and a real hallmark of COPE is um, the cases that we have that can be brought forward to the COPE forum. They get discussed. There are currently over 600 cases with advice. Um, they go back, I don't know if it's exactly 22 years, but they do go back quite a ways. And um, it's also interesting to see how cases have evolved and some of the guidance that COPE has provided has evolved over time. Um, and I should mention that there actually is a COPE forum coming up on Monday, uh, which is Veterans Day. Um, you can tell maybe our UK-based roots there. <laughs> um, and I think you need to register by Friday if you're interested, but actually a core topic that's being discussed is the use of artificial intelligence in decision making. Um, so it might be a really interesting discussion for those that are um, keen on that topic. Um, so in addition to all the freely available resources that I just mentioned, there are some resources that are limited to members. Um, we have a number of e-learning modules. Um, we have some letter templates, so if an editor needs to follow up with an author, or ultimately um, the Office of Research Integrity, um, some sort of templates, especially if you haven't experienced some of these issues in the past, those can be really valuable. Um, last year we promoted a self-audit tool for journals. So a lot of journals that have, are well established um, and, and became COPE members um, quite some time ago perhaps aren't um, always incorporating the latest and greatest um, kinds of advice and information, developments in the field, and this audit tool is actually a really interesting way of going back. And again, it's not dictating what policies you should have, but it's raising the kinds of issues about which you should be having conversations and developing policies that are appropriate for your discipline, your field, your society. Um, also limited to members are um, our in-person uh, seminars and workshops. We try to have one uh, in North America every one to two years, as well as some in Europe and um, increasingly in Asia as well. Um, and then the COPE forum that I mentioned as well. Um, I thought it might be interesting just to see um, COPE's most popular resources from last year. Um, they're color-coded, and I think they actually show some of the breadth of what it is that, that COPE is doing. So you'll see that a couple of them are around those 10 core practices. Um, there's some individual sort of standalone resources, and then this is case here from that case library that I mentioned as well. Um, I also thought it might be helpful to say what COPE is not. <laughs> um, in this survey uh, that we conducted, um, it's really interesting that there were a number of individuals who acknowledged that they had at least a medium or even a high awareness of COPE, and yet there's a lot of misconceptions even among that group about what COPE does and doesn't do and is and isn't. Um, so one common comment was that COPE offers guidelines and support, but not education. But in fact, we do provide education and those e-learning modules, which we are going to be expanding, um, are a good example of that. Um, certainly, folks seem to acknowledge that COPE is involved in publication ethics, but had no sense of any sort of specifics around that specific issues uh, that COPE might be addressing. Um, certainly, I think this is a big misconception that a lot of people assume that COPE adjudicates on issues rather than offering suggestions or that we um, set policies and, and have some sort of regulatory or statutory power. Um, what we try to do is set industry standards and, um, again, provide guidance and, and some of these emerging issues, raise the questions that, again, are most appropriate for the journal editors and their societies um, to be discussing together and setting policies that are appropriate. But we are not, um, we, we have no authority <laughs> in that way um, to adjudicate cases. Um, and ultimately, actually, many didn't even know what COPE does at all. So um, definitely, I think there's a lot of education that's needed, particularly among the AHSS community, about how COPE can be a resource for them. Um, this is just a picture of the COPE homepage, and I just thought it would be helpful to see. Um, that, that guidance tab that's up in the upper left-hand corner is where you can find all of those free resources, the flowcharts, the guidelines, and the cases. 
and then as you move on, you get to some of the uh, resources that are limited to members. And I thought I would just, again, this is a screenshot of just one sample document that we have. This one's about the systematic manipulation of the publication process. And in this particular um, document, you know, it's hard to see on the screen here, but this infographic, and hopefully you can see this sort of de decision tree sort of structure. Um, you know, if yes, go left, no, go right, um, down the chain. And um, this particular document has uh, uh, two components, actually. This one here is for what to do if you suspect systematic manipulation before publication, so after a manuscript has been submitted, but before it's actually been published. And then there's a separate infographic that what happens if you identify that after the article has actually been published. Um, I think it's probably worth saying that um, invariably there's no case that comes up that matches the flowcharts that we have exactly. Um, and the advice that we give to our journal editors very much is that it's helpful to follow the Koch guidelines as closely as possible because it provides all of us with as many protections as possible. And by all of us, I mean journal editors, any societies, and the publishers as well. Um, and, and that's really those protections or should situations escalate, um, I think perhaps more in the states, but there's a lot of threats of lawsuits. There are many things that actually make it that far in the process, but a lot of people like to start throwing around, well, I know a lawyer, or I'm, you're going to hear from someone about this. And so, um, following these COPE guidelines, um, which again are sort of the industry standard best practices, um, it is very, very helpful. Something you can point to. Um, following the survey and just thinking a little bit about next steps, um, it's clear that we need to help raise awareness of COPE among the AHSS community. Um, I think it's clear that we've identified some of these key areas and now we're trying to identify some of the key contacts who might be willing to come and help to volunteer with COPE to help um, expand existing resources so that they are more applicable and probably to develop some new resources as well. Um, and we're doing this in a number of ways with existing listservs, networks, um, peace societies, um, and we can certainly use your help as well. Um, as I mentioned, looking to update a lot of our current resources um, to ensure that the AHSS community um, is in incorporated and well represented. But I also think there's a chance for some new resources, um, certainly with some peer review guidance uh, for these disciplines specifically. And as we talked about before, I think addressing language editing and some of these writing quality barriers while trying to remain inclusive um, it is definitely something that we need to take a, a look at as well. Um, and so really our plan is to try to find editors who are doing this well and to bring them into the discussion. I mean, they don't necessarily need to join the COPE Council to do that, but we very much like um, suggestions from, from folks who are, are tackling these issues and, and think they have some suggestions that might be um, applicable more broadly. Um, and then further research, um, again, might be necessary, and um, COPE's text recycling guidelines, which is what addresses self-plagiarism, are also going to be reviewed next year as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Claire, who can share her sort of multifaceted perspective. It's like a really bad part of <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, So I come to talk to you today with kind of two different hats on. I am a librarian by training. I've worked in library for 17 years now, just coming up. But I'm also, I put academic there, but partly researcher. I wouldn't quite go as far as to call myself an academic. Um, I don't know about in the US, but in the UK that's actually quite uncommon. You're either one or the other, you're not usually both. In my librarian role, I've spent time uh, working cataloging and then a very short-lived career in customer service for reasons that will become apparent if you've ever been served by me at a library, not the career for me. And then for the past four years, I've actually been working in the scholarly communication department at Cambridge University Library. And I had a, a slightly strange role in that my role was to educate librarians in what is open access, data management, all that kind of thing, because Cambridge, as you would imagine, is a big research institution. There are 114 libraries, I believe. And so about 400, 500 library staff across those libraries, so it's quite a big job. Outside of that role, I sit on the editorial board of the new review of academic librarianship, 
And this was a role that I kind of uh, fell into. I was recommended by somebody who knew that I'd done my master's dissertation on the impact of social media. And that's what I do on the editorial board. I look after their Twitter accounts. And if you follow it now, you should see some magic tweeting, hopefully, if it's working from the account. I actually do quite a lot of peer review for them, I go to editorial board meetings, help shape the direction of the journal, and I actually do a little bit of my own research as well. I don't know when I find time to sleep. <laughs> so, my opinions today, I need to stress, are actually my opinions. They're not um, either Taylor and Francis or my employer's opinions. I um, should also say that I've spent my career working in a large very well-funded research institutions, so just bear that in the back of your mind. I know that not every library is like Cambridge. I do realise there's a world out there. As librarians, I think that we're in quite a unique position in the academic ecosystem in that we're part of the academic structure, certainly in the UK, but we're not credit-bearing in any way. We don't, we don't have any responsibility for course credit or grades or anything like that, so we're there. We're a defined unit, but we're not the teacher, the lecturer, someone who you can't ask for fear of looking daft, if that makes sense. So, you know, you can ask us the silly questions, and if you're anything like the students in my library, you get that all the time. So I think we need to use that slightly to our advantage, in that when we're giving advice and supporting people, we point out to resources such as the coach resources that are there, and show the uh, students what's available for them to use. Moving on from that, we talk about information literacy quite a lot, you know, teaching students how to find and evaluate information. It's certainly come up for me a lot in the past couple of days here. But should we extend that and make publication literacy, scholarly communication, I'm talk, scholarly communication literacy more a part of that information literacy offering? Is there another step that we need to take there? Should we be talking to them about issues like self-plagiarism? It comes up an awful lot when I talk to researchers at the university. And I don't wish to be rude, but these are university postgraduate students who've got to Cambridge. They're not stupid. I presume that they know something about the publication landscape, and yet I can't count the number of times someone has come to me and said, but I've signed this thing with this publisher. I don't really know what it means. I can just use this and put this online and put this in a different thing, can't I? And they just have no concept, because to them, and I can see where they're coming from. They wrote the thing. It's theirs. It doesn't matter who published it or if it's been published at all. They wrote it, they can use it, and it's really, really hard for them to wrap their head around. So maybe in our information literacy instruction, we can use the resources like the COPE and flowcharts and things that are out there and actually integrate those and take that a step further. I'd also quite like to see the, the wider library community get involved. I know that obviously you can't be expected to do everything and cover every subject. I myself have just moved into a, a role supporting the physical sciences which is hilarious because it's all the things I was terrible at at school, but I don't have that subject knowledge. But there are plenty of people out there that do. So why don't we mine that subject knowledge and get the community to help contribute and look at the resources? Maybe they can adapt some of them, maybe they can make suggestions about terminology that could be used. I know in um, Cambridge we have a very big problem with the understanding of the term data between arts and humanities students and sciences students. If you say data to a science student, they're with you. But if we're talking to arts and humanities students, we have to say information because if you say data, they won't listen to you. Because they don't do data, that's a science thing. So it's that kind of terminology that unless you've, you've been involved in that, you don't know. So perhaps bring some of that expertise in. Look at these resources, you can use that as an education opportunity for yourselves to find out about all these different areas. And then I'd like to see this all sort of building towards encouraging some more practitioner research. Certainly in the UK, it's not that common to have um, practicing librarians doing their own research because they're doing it on top of their day job and usually on top of their other commitments and their family and what have you. There's only so many hours in the day. But it would be nice if they realised that they, what they're actually doing through the innovation that they do as part of their day jobs is actually a form of research that can be written up, that can be shared as best practice. And I'd like to see more and more of that done. And I think that resources like this help kind of demystify the research process a little bit, and that you can say, well, actually, I understand that, and I know what that means, and oh, I know what that bit's talking about, and I teach that in my class. So then it might start to click in the brain. It's worth saying that before I um, 
I took on a role in scholarly communication before I um, sat on a journal board. This was all very, very new to me. I become very new to this. Trust me, if I can do it, anyone can. So in my role as an editor, I was thinking for this panel, what, what would I need with that kind of hat on? And actually it's quite, mirrors quite nicely what we need as a librarian, which I think shows where there's quite a link between the two roles there. So, number one, greater understanding of the peer review process. Really quick show of hands. Has anyone done peer review in the audience? Keep your hand up if you think you knew what you were doing as soon as you started. One, two, one. You're much better than my British colleagues, I will say. Because this is the number one complaint that I hear from uh, colleagues on the editorial board and other people that I know that are involved in research. You get handed something to peer review. What, what do I do with this? Do I read it and I make some comments on it? I know that much, but what exactly are those comments? How much depth do I go into? Do I have to worry about things like language issues? Is that the job of someone who's doing the copy editing? What do I do if I suspect a problem? All that kind of thing. And again, these, this is where these resources are really, really come in handy for me. We don't know enough, I don't think, as peer reviewers about the basics, and I think, certainly from personal experience, you feel a bit dark asking, because you feel like if you've got to this point, you should kind of know what you're doing. And that leads on to my next point there, is the problem of reviewer number two. So when you're, do when you're doing blind peer review, there's usually someone else doing it with you, and you usually assume, as the novice, that reviewer two is going to pick up anything that you miss, because that's the point of having two reviewers. But what if peer reviewer two is in exactly the same boat as you are? And they have absolutely no idea what they're doing either, or a very limited idea. That is when things, the ethical problems, start to slip through. So we need a greater awareness of the basics of what happens during peer review, and being able to understand all the different problems. And one thing that really struck me about the, um, the Cope flowcharts is it shows the consequences of the actions that we take, which to me as a novice was quite reassuring. I think that I knew roughly what would happen or what approaches would be taken. Thirdly, as journal editors, we need to provide really accessible submission guidelines. And I think the temptation when we do this is to write down absolutely everything in one really long 17-page document that no one's ever going to read. And again, with these resources, if we can either link out to what's already there, don't reinvent the wheel, or we can take a kind of leaf out of your book and make them more visually accessible, then perhaps people will actually read them, and we can use them as an education opportunity for our community. And then finally, linking back to what I said earlier, demystifying the research process a bit. So, my target audience as a journal editor is other librarians as authors. So if we can try and open up the research process and show them what they need to be doing, then hopefully they will uh, start to contribute more as well. Great. Sort of in conclusion, um, I encourage you to read the study. Um, there are copies of it on many of the chairs in the room, um, and there are several extra copies toward the front of the room if there wasn't one on your seat. Um, it's also available online. Um, so feel free to do that as well. Um, please provide feedback about it um, and share it. Share it with your colleagues. Um, please also volunteer. And I don't necessarily mean yourself, um, but you know, encourage researchers at your institution, um, perhaps particularly those in the arts and humanities and social sciences, to get involved or more involved in COPE. Um, how we're going to grow these resources is getting that community engaged. Um, and give us feedback, look at our resources, maybe try to familiarize yourself with them, again, think about how to incorporate those into the work that you're already doing, the interactions that you're already having. Um, and feel free to follow COPE on Twitter. Uh, we have a kind of obnoxious hashtag uh, where the O in COPE is actually not an O, it's a zero, uh, just to make that clear. Um, so I think that was everything here today. Thank you all for coming. Um, I think we're all going to stay around for a few minutes. If you had any questions, um, we'd love to chat with you. Thank you very much.